I got to get out of here and go get high. Why? <laughs> Why? Well, that's kind of what I would like to explain. So addiction is described as a three-part illness. Okay, this is how it's described in like the original 12-step material. Okay, a lot of people have never heard this, That especially people that aren't in some of these groups that really lay this stuff out there. Three-part illness, and in my humble opinion, any description of addiction that leaves this out is incomplete, okay? It's physical, it's mental, and it's spiritual. Now, this is something that everybody gets down with, mind, body, spirit. The whole, the whole, the holistic view. Everybody, everybody seems to pretty much acknowledge that the human beings are made up of mind, body, spirit, even if they don't really know how to explain the spirit part mm -hmm. or what that really means to them. And <clears throat> so the way that it's laid out is physically. Um, I have, and many other addicts have, what is called the physical, rea the physical allergy of the craving. Now, the first time I heard that, I said... I don't think I'm allergic. I can do quite a bit. You know what I'm saying? I, like, like the, I, I'm not allergic. I have an insane tolerance. You know, I can mm -hmm. do enough uh, uh, pain pills to kill a grizzly bear. I'm not allergic, you know? And the guy that explained this to me said, no, 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 no. The, the allergy, whether it's perfectly scientifically, medically accurate or not, the, the, descript, the definition that we're going with here is an abnormal reaction, okay? Allergy being an abnormal reaction. So about 92% of the population, if, if you love beer, three beers is better than none. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If you have a reaction to beer, three beers better equal as much as I want and a trip to the ATM and then to the coke man's house mm -hmm. or we're gonna have a problem mm -hmm. i'm having a reaction so when i start i don't know how much i'm gonna do i don't know how much i'm gonna spend i don't know where i'm gonna go i don't know when i'm gonna stop nobody knows what the heck's gonna happen am i gonna be nice am i gonna be mean am i gonna get naked am i gonna get arrested am i get, am i gonna break your coffee table am i gonna throw up nobody nobody knows and it's this physical reaction, and it might not happen every single time, but if it happens even some of the time, you probably have this. Now, this is the piece that's so uniquely, um, it's, 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 that's so unique and that, everybody, that, that I find very interesting because of this whole trauma thing. Now, I'm, like I said earlier, I'm not the world expert on this. This is just my experience with this. Zach, how many speeches have you given? How many groups have you talked to? <laughs> Thousands, right? You you've you've been to rehabs. You've talked to groups. You've helped people uh, individually. So you have a lot of expertise and study this. So it's not like you're shooting off your hip here. That's true. So in my world, I would classify you as an expert. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um. Let's put it this way: nobody walks up to some. Yes, trauma is real. It makes it. It can. It can throw gas on the fire. It might be why you started. It might be something that made it worse. It might be the reason that you turned to this. It could be involved in this. You should seek therapy because the recovery side of things can do stuff that therapy can't, and therapy can do stuff that the recovery can't. And they're both important. And obviously, healing your traumas is going to help you live a a nice sober mm -hmm. life and not have these things that bother you that could make you turn back towards these things. It's very important and it's interwoven and parallel, no doubt. But nobody walks up to someone who says, hey, has say a peanut allergy and says, my God, what happened to you when you were a child? What, what did it? I know I've, I've heard that when you eat peanuts, your throat closes up. What happened to you? It's physical. It's, it's, it's thought to be highly genetic. Everything actually about me physically is genetic. Even if you don't see the same trait in my parents. If I'm tall, it's genetic, even if both my parents are short. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times you will see this stuff in family trees. Not every time. But it's still genetic. Mm -hmm. If you have it, you have it. Mm -hmm. But my family, my, my, my dad's inside, entire side of the family. One of my sisters passed away from a drug overdose. Um, my other one is sober right now. My other sister who I love, I'm not sure exactly where she's at with things right now, but things have been very up and down over the past while. They all saw me struggle hardcore 
for the longest and thought I was probably going to be the first one to go. Um, my uncle, my dad's brother, was the priest who was an alcoholic who got sober in AA. My dad's mom, my dad's dad, all the brothers, untimely deaths, crazy stories, brutal, vicious alcoholics from Ireland and Sylvania that immigrated over here. Okay, so this physical piece, it's, it's really just as simple as that. Some people eat tomatoes, they think they're delicious. Some people eat tomatoes and think that they're disgusting. Some people get a professional, you get them a gift card to a spa and they go get a professional massage and it feels great. And some people, they don't want that because it's ticklish. They don't enjoy it. Some people smoke weed, they get paranoid. Some people smoke weed and they love it. So part of it is that they love it. The other part of it is this abnormal reaction of the craving that sets you off on this terrible cycle where you spent more than you intended to, you stayed out later than you were supposed to, you drank more than you planned to for no other reason than you started. If you're really honest with yourself, you're not like thinking about this trauma and going, oh man, I got to get that out of my head. I got to drink a little more and make it go away. You're thinking, it's Tuesday. I stopped here for lunch. I was going to have two beers and some chicken wings. And now nine beers later, I'm still here and I'm wondering what the heck happened to me. Well, that's only happening to about eight to 10% tops of people that drink. Mm. It's not happening to the other people. They're not experiencing it at all, even if they enjoy it, even if it makes them feel good, even if they get maybe drunk a couple times a year. They're not experiencing that, right? So that's the first piece. Now, the data shows that nothing will permanently remove that. There's medications that only uh, that are only um, work on a, a particular substance, maybe drinking or opiates or something that can try to uh, block things or make you have a, a bad reaction to that substance if you ingest it. But th it doesn't make the allergy permanently go away, and those things don't work on all the other substances. Okay, so there's no like methoxone. Mm -hmm. Okay, there, you, you, you can always find something to get intoxicated if you want to, or you can stop taking those things because you want to get buzzed. Mm -hmm. And then when you go back to it, the allergy is still there. So that allergy, it just is what it is. If you're allergic to peanuts, what do you do? You say, man, that was one of my favorite foods. This is going to be really inconvenient. I'm going to have to read all the labels from now on and try to avoid this. You know, uh, man, this this sucks, but I'm going to make a decision right here and now as a sane human being with willpower and a mind and a brain to just not eat any more peanuts. Because when I do, my throat closes up and it's not good. And then you do it. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't have peanut anonymous. <laughs> because people are able to make the decision to not anymore eat any more peanuts and then just to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why the second part centers in the mind. The second part of this illness is mental. And it's, it's described as an obsession and an insanity that develops over time. Okay, so the, the insanity is the thought that <clears throat> is believing the lie. The insanity is this time it'll be different. This time I'll just do a little bit. Or I'm so miserable right now while I'm sober, for whatever reason, whether people other people understand it or not, I'm so miserable right now, sober, that I think that getting high would make me feel better, even though three days ago with tears in my eyes, I said I never wanted to do this again, and it was so bad that I wanted help getting sober. Well, that's insane. Yeah. Very insane. It is. And I, and, and I was insane. It happens all the time. All the time. And... um. And so, and the obsession is when it's on you, you're aware of the obsession. It's when you want it so bad that it becomes paramount to other things that you know it shouldn't be paramount to. Mom, I know it's your birthday and you invited me to go out to dinner and I do love you. And if you told me that I love drugs more than you, I would get upset, but I'm out of stuff and the guy in Jacksonville just called me. So instead of coming to your dinner, I'm actually going to pick that over you. Mm -mm -mm. And so... The third part, and I love talking about this, mm -hmm. the third aspect is spiritual, and they call this the spiritual malady, okay? So there's a bunch of different ways that you can think about this. Um, best way that I can, for, for, for all intents and purposes of this example, your spirit, my spirit, is, is the essence of who I am. 
Okay, it's more than just my mind. It's more than my emotions. It's more than my thought processes. It's more than my physical body. It's what makes me me. It's my unique personality. It's my unique life force inside of me, okay? When it leaves my body, I'm no longer here. But my body still is. Mm -hmm. My brain still is. It's not functioning. So my that's that's me. It's what makes me me. And I will never forget... It's funny how some of these stories, you know, they, they get out there and other people remember them differently and and all that kind of stuff. But I, I remember this moment where they did a, an intervention on me before they talked me into going to a rehab. And if you've ever had an intervention done, they're no fun. Because the, the entire point of an intervention, and they're a good thing, is, is, is people attempting to save your life. They're attempting to hit you with such a powerful emotional recall that if there's even a flicker left inside of the core of the center of your heart of who you used to be that cares enough, they want to see if they can get that out of you. And even though you're out of your mind and burning all your bridges, can I, can I, if there's even a little bit of you in there left, can we talk to that? And can we make you say, okay, I'll go get help. Right. So people write these letters that are intended to be very emotional and let you know how they feel and how it was watching you do what you've been doing to yourself and and all that. Well, during my intervention, I'm high. I felt like a rabid possum in the corner. I just wanted to jump out of the window. You know, like, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't want to be there. I don't want you know, it was I'm just like, get me out of here. Get me out of here. Well, it comes around to my mom and um, <clears throat> she holds up this uh, picture from when I was like 14 playing baseball. And she says, where's this boy? Mm. You're not him anymore. You don't smile the way he smiled. You don't treat us the way he treated us. You don't do any of the things he did to enjoy himself. I don't know who you are and what you've done with my son, but you're not him. I want him back. So I'm sitting there, and the first thing I thought, honestly, was I'm glad I didn't eat any mushrooms before this because this is tripping me out, you know what I mean? But that's, you know, in all seriousness, I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, my mom, who I grew in her womb, who has known me my entire life since before I can even remember, is sitting here telling me that I'm not me. Well, who am I? And she was right. I only existed to get money and get drugs and get alcohol and get intoxicated. Actually, I created chaos everywhere I went. The more you loved me, the more you were hurt by my existence. And so that's pretty spiritual. Mm -hmm. If you ask me, I'm not me. I don't know who I am. I'm not able to be successful at even the things that I've been the most passionate and naturally gifted at my entire life anymore. Um, Here's another one. It affected my morals to the point where because of because of this whole physical, mental side of things and this obsession and this insanity and this cycle, I would draw lines in the sand. And I used to say this. This is hilarious. I would say, I might commit felonies every day, but I'm a good guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like I'm a good guy. Like, like there's people in the world who are just bad apples and they just make you feel uncomfortable and they just seem almost like they're just evil and you don't want to be around them and you don't trust them and everything. I don't drive sober ever and I buy narcotics every day and I've stolen a few things, but I'm a good guy, you know, <laughs> which is hilarious, but that's what I thought. So I would draw a line in the sand and I'd say, there's just certain things I'm just not going to do. And then I would do those things. And I'd say, all right, I'm a little bit of a, piece of crap but there's certain things still that I'm just not gonna do mm. and I don't do those things by the end of it what I thought about myself was I'm a piece of crap and there's nothing I won't do to get high that's how I felt about myself talk about low self esteem sure <laughs> And so that's very spiritual. And, the, and the, the, the final part about that spiritual side of it that helps me kind of explain it the best I can is without realizing it, I had begun to worship drugs and alcohol. Now, I would have never said that. I didn't even 
uh, know that. I obviously didn't make a little shrine and get down and pray to drugs and alcohol or anything like that. Sure. But let's let's put it this way: that f- whenever I open my eyes, sometimes the first thing I thought was, "Man, I'm still alive." Unfortunately, but you know, then mm-hmm. sometimes it would be, then it would be, I got to get some drugs and alcohol. First thing I thought about when I opened my eyes. Last thing I thought about when I passed out. I could be so hammered I could hardly walk, but if I was still conscious, you couldn't pry my drink out of my hands and without fighting me. And um, and with it, man, I could negotiate with Pablo Escobar. I felt like King Kong. Without it, I was helpless and desperate. It did for me what I could not do for myself. My entire life revolved around it. It decided where I went, with who, how much I spent, who I avoided, who I lied to. I picked it over my entire family and over my, it was stronger than my basic instincts of survival for food, water, and shelter. I spend rent money on drugs and be homeless, but that's okay as long as I have some drugs today. Mm-mm-mm. I'm not buying any food. I can buy, I can buy a, a 99 cent cheeseburger a couple times a week and stay alive and just drink at a water fountain. Everything goes towards this. So I worshipped it. So it ran my entire life. And so, uh, and, the, and then there's some really good language that says we were restless, irritable, and discontented. Unless we could again experience the sense of ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Which we see others taking with impunity. They can do it. Why can't I? Mm-hmm. So when I'm sober... That's the state. That's the reason why when I was at my dad's house with the Bob Marley and the steaks and the mm-hmm. beautiful day that I wasn't okay. It's a spiritual malady. And my solution has become drugs and alcohol. And my insane mind and obsession ensures that I'll do them again. And then my physical reaction ensures that there's nothing normal about the way that I do them. So it's a huge problem. Mm-hmm. And I do that until I burn it all down. And then with tears in my eyes, I say, oh, God, I never want to do this again. Stay sober as long as I can until the spiritual malady is too brutal and my mind talks me into doing it. And I do it and I just boom, 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 boom. So how did you get sober? So um, the, the, the guy that I was, I was in rehab with this guy, I actually just saw him a couple days ago. And he, uh, I hadn't seen him in like eight years. Mm. There was a guy I was in, in detox with, <clears throat> and he was about 21 years older than me, and he's a psychologist, PhD psychologist. So you're in detox with a guy who yep. is in detox, or is he he's a doctor in, there? No, he's in detox. And he's a psychologist. And he's a psychologist. Wow. And I wasn't used to that, because I'm like, most of the people in here are like me, whatever that means. They're not, I mean, it was just odd to, 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 to be around this guy who obviously had willpower, Obviously had intelligence mm-hmm. um, and had completed a PhD. I mean, and now at this point, I've met people who are special forces and judges and lawyers and surgeons and uh, y- you name it. Nobody's off limits. Pro athletes? Yep. Musicians? Yep. Artists? Geniuses? Millionaires? Millionaires? Business? Huge big time business owners? All of it. Literally, I can actually think of an example of each one of these. Mm-hmm. I'm not just throwing words out there. And and so <laughs> um, I meet him in there, and he's 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 got a genius-level IQ. We became best buddies instantly just because we met in detox. It's like, I'm here, you're here. Both of our lives are dumpster fires, you know, uh, let's be friends, you know, and, and, and he's hilarious and we just vibe. And so, um, he's just a great friend and a good guy. And so he talked me into going over to the rehab because I didn't want to go because mm-hmm. what's the point? I don't want to do all this stuff that I've been doing for seven years that doesn't work. Why would we do it again? He said, what do you got? Where are you going to go? <laughs> what do you have to lose? And I was like, well, nothing, I guess, so, okay, let's go. So I, I went over to the rehab, and um, his insurance ran out before mine, right? So uh, he it was, a great, it was a great rehab, best rehab I ever went to. I mean, I did things like sleep at night and eat food and drink water 
things that normal human pe- pe- people mm-hmm. do that I hadn't been doing a whole lot of, you know, like days of the week and day and night didn't mean anything to me anymore, but I got on this normal awake during the day, sleep at night, drinking, eating food and water. And that's really good for your body and your brain, you know, as a human, you know, <laughs> I hadn't been doing that. And, um, and they had great therapy and, 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 um, introduced me to the local recovery community and all that kind of stuff, which was vital for me. And it was really good, but he gets out of there and, um, he's gone for about a month and he calls me at the room phone we had. We had a little telephone in our, in our apartment that we shared Mm -hmm. in the rehab and he had previously been my roommate so he knew the number and he called me and um he's all excited and uh oh and I want to say this I don't represent any particular 12-step program Uh, I'm not a spokesperson for any of those sorts of things you know but I have experienced uh the 12 steps programs and what they've done in my life and I can't tell my story without talking about that Mm -hmm. but I'll just I'm, as part of the traditions and some of that stuff, we, we don't like to be the spokesperson for, for a particular organization or, or anything yeah. like that for a lot of reasons. But I'm, I'm going to talk about it because it's my story, right? So he calls me up and he says, um, he says, dude, I've been working the steps. And I said, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. What does that mean? I've got to memorize. I've been to a thousand of these different meetings and different programs mm-hmm. and fellowships and all that stuff. I know them. They they seem great. Look, you can read down the list and go, okay, that's pretty good stuff there. But what are you doing? And he says, well, dude, this 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 book here it's, is our basic text, and it would be like if you were in a math class and you had a textbook. The instructions for how to do this are actually in this book. And I said... Are you kidding me? Which is actually sad that I could be going to meetings for all these years and never have heard that mm. and never have had that pointed out to me. Um, now, there may have been times somebody was trying to help me out. I didn't want to listen, and I can admit that. Yeah. But really, that should be like you can't go to a meeting and not know that, especially not a 1,000 of them. That's right. Okay? And so <clears throat> he tells me that, and I'm like, my mind's kind of blown. And then, and and this guy, by the way, part of his story, and I'm not knocking this or anything, but part of th- his story was he was a very staunch atheist. Mm. And I love this guy, and he was an amazing human being and hilarious and uh, g- good heart and all that kind of stuff. Very staunch atheist. And uh, he didn't like any of the spiritual parts of the program where it started talking about a higher power or turning your will over to God or anything like that. He, did, he would actually get upset at rehab and even try to talk other people into seeing why that that's just ridiculous and why would you believe in some fairy in the sky that you know and he didn't want he just didn't think that that was a a good thing at the time when we were in rehab well now he's out of there he's doing this he's pumped up and then he said something to me that this is the reason why I wanted to do it he said I think I'm having a spiritual experience and I said what did you just say to me because when I tell you this is the last dude on the entire planet that I ever thought that I would hear say anything like that, that was him. Mm. And I said, I'll tell you what. This is the only thing I can think of that I have never actually tried. And I'm watching something happen to you. And I want to do exactly what you're doing with exactly who you're doing it with so that I can see if maybe that happens to me. Because as far as I can see, this is my only shot. So I did. Mm. And then you work the steps. Yes, I did. And you continue to work the steps. Yes, I do. And you share the story and share the steps and you work with people. Yes, yes. And and this is the thing. A lot of people go, I used to be annoyed by people that I perceived as like maybe what I am now. Because I get to travel all over. I get to go to different countries, different states, all over different cities and talk at recovery things and big conferences and dinners and conventions and little things. I go to detoxes and rehabs like every week with maybe 5, 10, 15 people in the room. It doesn't matter how many people are there, if it's recorded or if there's a microphone or not. I just, I just, just, this helps me stay sober. I love it. This is what I do. And, um, and uh, he, he, Oh man, what was I saying? You were talking about 
you're, uh, you hate when people do this, I think, Be, being like you maybe. Oh, yes, yes. So I would think, thank you, I would think, um, there you go, drugs may have had an effect on my brain, brother. I can't. <laughs> if you hadn't have done that. You, you... <gasps> Wait, what was I talking about? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, <laughs> so I would see a guy like me who's getting up there being super positive, and I'm already like, all right, dude, I'm not feeling positive. It's kind of annoying me. And then, and then I, and then I might think, okay, look, you had a time in your life where you partied and things got bad, and now you're doing really great, good for you, and you want to get up here and give little positivity speeches about how drugs are bad and 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 you should work out and kick butt in life and eat your vegetables and you know, and I'm like, that's great. You know, good for you. My experience is not that I finally amassed my willpower and made a firm decision. Finally, I learned my lesson and decided never to do this again and then just did it. That is not what happened. I came to the realization that I could not do this. No matter how hard I tried with everything in me for every reason that I had to do it. I could not do it. And so I had to come to the space where I was ready to surrender. And instead of willpower, I had to try something new. I had to try willingness. And they're very similar, but very different. Willpower says, I can do this and I'm going to make it happen. Willingness says, I'm willing to show up. Yes, I will. Yes, I will do these things. I'm willing to do them. And willingness was what I needed to go through with the process. Willpower, no. Couldn't do it. Willingness to go through with the process. So I go through with this process, and I end up getting, uh, instead of just a belief, and instead of just foxhole prayers, I end up forming a connection and a relationship with God like I had never had in my entire life. And feeling him flow into me in ways that I can't even describe to you. I was living in a halfway house right after I got out of rehab. And I get emotional talking about this sometimes. I woke up one morning. Partway through this process. Maybe not even halfway through this process. And I wake up that one morning and I go out in the kitchen. And I thought to myself, what do I want for breakfast? And then it just hits me. And I got, I mean, I got goosebumps talking about this. What do I want for breakfast? Not how do I get $300? Not I wish I wasn't alive. Not who's coming to kill me. Not what lies did I tell yesterday that I need to remember today. What do I want for breakfast? Dude, freedom. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do it. I was just willing to do these things, and God did this for me and in me. It wasn't done by me. If you had a guy who was a, a, a prisoner of war, and he's captured, and he's behind enemy lines, and he doesn't know if he's ever going to see his family again, he's being mistreated, and he's terrified, and he's enduring horrible circumstances, and then one night, during the middle of the night, a SEAL team comes in. He hears the locks breaking, and all of a sudden, his doors opened up, and his but his boys are there, his buddies are there, and they said, "We got you, brother. You're going home. Come with me." And they take him and they get him on the chopper, and they're taking him home. You're going to see your family. You're going to see your wife. You're going to see your kids. We're taking you home, buddy. How do you feel? Do you think he would say, "I'm just so proud of myself," or do you think he would say, "I'm just so thankful you came and got me"? Mm -hmm. that's how I feel. Mm. I'm grateful. I didn't save myself. I was willing to participate in this miracle. God saved me. The people that showed me this saved me. And they showed me a way that I could live where not only is addiction chronic and progressive, but my recovery mm -hmm. could be progressive and continue to grow and continue to thrive as long as I stay close to God, perform his works well, and continue to carry this message and live this lifestyle. If, I, if there's ever a point where I think I don't need to do that anymore and I stop, start praying for me and start mm -hmm. the timer because mm -hmm. I don't know when, but it's not going to be good. And so my goal is to never stop 
doing these things and never stop telling people about this miracle that happened in my life and how it actually can happen for them too. Zach Zeter, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you're wondering why I'm pointing my fingers like this, it's because momentarily a video is going to pop up here and here that you can enjoy watching. Please like and subscribe to this channel as well as turn your notifications on. My mom would really appreciate it.